and cover up. After turning Order. Melbourne into the world's most uh, Senator lockdown Henderson. city, Senator don't Henderson. Vote. Senator Henderson, I would ask you to res order, 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 uh, Senator Polly. Uh, Madam President, I was just trying to draw your attention to the fact that the Honourable Senator failed to acknowledge the Premier by his correct title. Thank you. And uh, the time has expired. Um, we're going to move to question time, but before I call Senator McKenzie, uh, I just want to announce some uh, visitors. So I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of a delegation from New Zealand from the New Zealand Parliament, led by the chairperson of the Governance and Administrative Committee, Mr. Ian McKelfey. Welcome. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. You now you are now in the best chamber. Um, I also draw to the uh, attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the 2022 Australian Defence Force Parliamentary Program exchange participants. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the Senate and thank you for the work that you've contributed to in your time here. I just want to go to the um, point of order that Senator Birmingham um, asked me to review yesterday, and whilst I'm not changing my decision, I do think it deserves some clarity. So um, yesterday I undertook to review the Hansard of a question from Senator Hume to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher, concerning gas prices. The Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, raised the point of order on direct relevance. I noted that a minister is directly relevant when responding to both the preamble and the specific question. The preamble identified the Treasurer's statement about acting with urgency on gas prices. The specific question framed the matter around resolving uncertainty in the government policy on gas prices. There was a political frame to the question, and I consider the minister was being directly relevant in exploring the causes and emergence of high gas prices and returning the political serve in relation to uncertainty in energy prices. It would not have been in order for the minister to focus solely on those matters, given that the question asked about the government's intentions. However, by the time Senator Birmingham rose to take his point of order, the minister had come back to what the government had done and was doing, uh, and in doing so was in order. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Pre President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. After being questioned at the Australian Financial Review's Infrastructure Summit yesterday about the Suburban Rail Loop project, which didn't go through the Prime Minister's stated Infrastructure for Australia process, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, who is quoted in the AFR today, said, I'm pretty confident that the project's right and is right for investment. On what basis of rigorous assessment, other than her own confidence, did the government approve $2.2 billion of funding in the budget for the suburban rail loop project? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Henderson, the minister has not even begun her response. I would ask you to be quiet. Minister thank Wong. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you to the senator for the question. And I do recall the extent to which all of us tried to campaign for state elections in this chamber, and I'm not sure any of us are actually very successful in it, but I'm happy to take the question. And if, if my colleague, Minister Watt, who actually represents the minister whose quote uh, you are using, uh, is able to assist, I'm sure he will. Uh, in relation to infrastructure projects, uh, we have said uh, that we will review infrastructure projects to better align investment with construction market capacity. We are consulting. Order. Consulting, uh, look, uh, you know, you are in a permanent state of outrage, aren't you? A permanent Order. state of outrage. There's, there's never any light and shade with this particular senator. It's just permanently outraged. We're always right up there, aren't we? But I digress. I digress. As I said in response to the budget, as I said in response to the budget, 
Uh, the, uh, we are aligning Order. investment with construction market capacity. We are consulting with states and territories throughout this process. This is the responsible and honest thing to do. If those opposite were honest about this, they would recognise that the government is increasing funding to infrastructure in regional Australia over the next decade. I'll repeat that. Increasing funding uh, to regional infrastructure. Uh, over the next decade, uh, but rather than simply announcing, we are ensuring uh, that we can actually deliver on what we say we will do. Uh, and in relation to the points that the senator raised in her question, I would would say it is interesting to get a question which goes to business cases and probity from a yeah. minister who never demonstrated that, who never demonstrated that uh, in her period in government. And here we, um, you might think that's outrageous, Order. but I think the public Order. record speaks for itself. Order. Well, well, which, which part of that does which part of that Order. does Senator McKenzie uh, want me to, to resolve from? In relation, well, uh, thank, thank you, you with, Minister. I'm, I'm happy your to, time has much. expired. Um, just a moment, Senator McKenzie. Before I call you, there was so much noise uh, during the minister's response. I found it very difficult to hear. I would ask minister, I would ask all senators to respect that the minister has the right to answer the question in silence. Um, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, given the government's documents show funding would not flow to Dan Andrews' controversial suburban rail loop project until 24-25, at the earliest 19 months away, for what reason was funding awarded in the October 22 budget, other than to suit Labor's political timelines? Yeah. Uh, order. Order. Order on my right. Order. I'm not going to call the minister until there's quiet. Senator Henderson, please. It's, we are not at a football match. We are in Senate question time, and you are to be silent to hear the response and out of respect to the person answering the question. And before I call um, the minister response, I do remind Senator McKenzie to refer to um, people by their correct titles. So it would be Premier Andrews. Thank you, Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, I'm asked, I'm asked a... Really? <laughs> she can't. Can you? anyway. your, your team love it when you use um, it all the time. Uh, you, the... Uh, I'm asked why the government funded the project. It's called honouring an election commitment. Uh, we had an election commitment to provide $2.2 billion towards early works for suburban rail loop east, and a detailed business and investment case was released by Victoria um, last Wong. year, which demonstrated a benefit cost Senator ratio. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. A point of order relevance, uh, Madam President. Mine went to the profiling of the project. The funding doesn't flow in your own government documents till 2024-25. You could have run it through Infrastructure Australia uh, right. processes, but Senator you announced McKenzie. it in this budget. Senator McKenzie, that question does go to why, and that's what the minister is responding to. She is being directly relevant. Please continue, Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, I was actually asked um, why we were funding it, uh, and I was explaining to the senator why we were funding it. And I'd also make the point, and she may not wish to hear the facts about the detailed business and investment case. It demonstrated a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7. That is a dollar seventy return for every dollar invested. It will still be assessed, subject to assessment by Infrastructure Australia, as is required. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you. It's nice to know it will be going through Infrastructure Australia. Minister King also to told the AFR Infrastructure Summit that if Infrastructure Australia's review of the project sees it not worth progressing, that she would personally talk to the Victorian Labor government about, and I quote her again, how they think they can make it stack up. Minister, at what point of the PM's reformation of Infrastructure Australia are we going to see ministers not intervening to make sure that projects unfit for funding are going to be persisted for until they stack up? Minister. Well, uh, I hadn't heard that quote before, uh, but if I. Well, Order. Sorry, I've been doing a few other things. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't sit around reading the quote.
quotes of every, every... No, it's not that. I'm just saying, you know, I don't have every quote of a minister who I don't represent. I'm sure Senator Watt would have an excellent answer on this question. Word. I'm sure he read, he read every word. Uh, but minister word. Wong, please resume oh, really? your seat. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. As Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Madam President, as uh, Minister Wong is seeking to elicit a laugh from her side, uh, the relevance Senator of McKenzie, my question. No, is not I'm sorry. A point of order. That is not a point of order. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Uh, Senator Watt. Yeah. Um, thank you, President. I think you were going there anyway, but surely. Senator Bacchetti has to Senator name Watt, the point of order. You what is the point? We would have to ask us the point of order. I've ruled the point of order out of order. 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 Seriously, Senators. I'm going to ask Minister Wong to continue. Th thank you, President. What I was going to say, from what I heard of the quote, uh, it, is, it seems an em eminently sensible position to ensure that Infrastructure Australia can properly assess uh, this important project, which uh, the, uh, the government uh, was elected with a, a commitment to uh, implement, which we are funding, which already has a business case. It seems to me of eminently sem sensible Order. position to ensure that it Order. is properly Order. eminently sensible to ensure it properly stacks up, and that's what the minister's Thank quote you, goes Minister to. Wong. Your time has expired. S uh, Senator White. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The Albanese government's proposed changes to workplace relations laws will deliver much-needed job security and wage increases after a decade of neglect by the Liberals Order. and Nationals. Order. How will the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill support small businesses to bargain with their workers, and what does this mean for workers? Uh, minister Watt. Thank you. Order. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White, who I again uh, one of the people on our side of the chamber who has a long history of standing up for the rights of workers uh, and also having formed very cooperative relationships with business uh, in her career in the union movement. And Senator White is a great example of what our government is trying to do, which is build partnerships between unions, workers and business for the benefit of the economy and for the benefit of those businesses and also those workers. I understand it's a foreign concept for those opposite who just thrive on conflict and want to keep us in that conflict-driven environment that we've been in for 10 years, but some of us actually want to move on. And you know what? So does small business. Let me just give you one example of the small businesses out there that are actually looking forward to the kind of multi-employer bargaining uh, that, that we are proposing to have. Now, uh, Senator Watt, I'm going to wait for silence. Order. I would ask Senators Mackenzie and Henderson in particular to lower the tone of your interjections, please. Yeah. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Now, on the one hand, the opposition demands examples of small businesses that support the system we're trying to bring in. And the minute you try and do it, they don't want to hear about it. And that's because the opposition are intent on keeping our country in a conflict-driven model that does not work for anyone. Ms Julie Price, the executive director of the Community Child Care Association, gave evidence to the Senate inquiry recently. She represents over 750 community not-for-profit early childhood education and care centres. She gave evidence explaining that multi-employer bargaining in Victoria had delivered above award wages for workers over a decade with the support um, of employers. What? what she what? said was that— Please resume your seat. Order, Senators, particularly those on my left. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you, Thank you President. Now, Ms Price, who represents hundreds of community-owned uh, childcare centres, made the point that the agreement they had struck across a range of enterprises covers just under 60 services in Victoria. It delivers better wages, 16 per cent above the award. Uh, and you know what? She goes on to say uh, that the centres are community-owned, they're managed by boards and volunteers, and they don't have the financial resources or the expertise in the IR to be able to negotiate an agreement themselves. This is the kind of system that small businesses can take advantage of to avoid having big HR departments and strike Thank agreements you, with their workers, White, which is what they want. Your time has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Um, Minister, it's well known that small businesses are more award reliant. Why is it important to provide small businesses with additional support to create agreements with workers? 
Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White. As we say, we understand that it's a foreign concept for the opposition that employers and workers can act together cooperatively for both their benefit, but our government actually understands that. Mr Mimo Scavera, the president of the HVAC Manufacturing and Installation Association, also gave evidence to the Senate inquiry. He represents nine major employers collectively Order. employing approximately 900 um, people. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, no, Senator McKenzie, I'm waiting until your own side is quiet. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, on relevance to the good senator's question, um, can the minister name one small business that uh, actually Senator supports McKenzie. Labor's reforms? Senator McKenzie, reforms? that is not a point of order. Thank you. Um, Senator Wong. Well, President, I, the persistent point of orders which actually go to the content of substantive debate, we're very happy to have substantive debate. This is time for question time. This is really, well. Order. This, is, this is not the ways in which points of orders have traditionally been used, used nor should be used. If the, minister, if the senator wants a debate, we can have a debate. Thank you, Minister Wong. I ruled the point of order out of order. Um, minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. And isn't it terrible to see the coalition not want to hear from employer groups? You really would have thought, you really would have thought that of all the parties, they don't, they would support employer groups, but not the ones that support multi-employer bargaining. The ones that oppose it are fine. The ones that support it are terrible. Mr. Senator Scavera Watt. said, "It's not about Senator having Watt. a race to the bottom." To put it bluntly, Senator at Watt. the moment, please resume your seat. Again, noise, please. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you. Mr Scavera said it's not about having a race to the bottom, to put it bluntly. At the moment, the major construction projects don't have any regulation in relation to pay. So you have a mixture of people on a site that will either be enterprise agreement covered, award covered or covered by whatever other means people are creating. Uh, we're hoping that through this mechanism we can have an industry agreement through multi-enterprises. That's what we're aiming Thank for, you, to Minister regulate the White, market. Your time has expired. Um, Senator White, second supplementary. Minister, why is it urgent that we pass these reforms before Christmas? Minister. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Please resume. Please resume your seat. Once again, the interjections, particularly from my left, are absolutely disorderly, and I would ask you to be quiet so that we can all hear the minister's response. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. It is urgent that we pass these reforms before Christmas because they will be good for workers and good for small businesses. They will be good for the economy. And Senator Pocock and Senator Lambie, we all know that you have important decisions to make about this legislation in coming days, and I encourage you to think about the arguments we are putting Senator forward, McKenzie. that small businesses are putting forward, or you can decide to line up with that rabble over there who want to continue to keep Australia in conflict and low wages and low productivity. I know enough about Senator Pocock and Senator Lambie that they want to see agreements and they want to see cooperation in workplaces that deliver to businesses and workers, and that is exactly Order. what we are putting forward here. The comments that we saw given at the Senate inquiry by representatives of childcare centres, by representatives of manufacturing industries indicate um, uh, that— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Pocock. Point of order, President. Uh, if the minister could please direct his comments through the president. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pocock, I'll oh, order, order, order. Order. Senators on my left. Minister Watt, if you would direct your uh, contributions to the chair. Thank you, President. And, and through you, President, I say to Senator Pocock and, and Senator Lambie, Take the evidence of the committee inquiry into account. We've heard from childcare representatives, we've heard from manufacturing representatives who say that multi-employer bargaining is what they want. Uh, thank it's you, good Minister. For their Your time has expired. Working. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The October budget contained no immediate relief for Australians facing rising inflation and cost of living crises. Instead, the government committed to spending $2.2 billion on the suburban rail loop despite the Victorian Auditor-General finding that the Victorian government, and I quote, did not demonstrate their economic rationale for the entire project, and they have told us they have no plans to do so. Minister, isn't it true that Labor is supporting Dan Andrews' pet projects 
that don't stack up, but refuses mm. to find sensible policies that will reduce the cost of living for Victorians without driving up inflation. Uh, before I call no, the minister, not, order, order, order. I remind, I remind senators that Senator Wong. I remind senators that uh, state leaders are entitled to be addressed by their correct title, and that's the second time in a matter of minutes I've had to remind uh, senators on my left of that, Minister. Uh, thank you. And um, I think in, the best way to answer this question is to say I completely reject um, the assertions put in the question, uh, and I reject the assertion that there was no cost of living uh, relief in the budget. Uh, if you read the budget, you would read um, the investments that we are making in cheaper childcare, in renewable energy, in free TAFE, uh, as some of those investments. Also, I would say look at the uh, more than $32 billion in increased payments through pensions and other payments through the social security system. $32 billion, the biggest increase to assist. And the reason, Senator Henderson, I hear you yelling at me and interjecting, the reason that those payments have increased so considerably is to assist lower income households with those increased costs of living, largely driven by those increases you hid before you, the change of government to the increases in energy prices. Uh, so the reference Minister, to cost of living relief. Uh, Senator Henderson. I ask the senator to please direct her comments through the chair. Thank you. Uh, she is doing that, Senator Henderson. Minister, please continue. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, well, perhaps if Senator Henderson stopped interjecting, um, then we would have we wouldn't be in a position where we had to to respond to those interjections. Order. Uh, in terms of Order. infrastructure, and the Senator Van's question went to infrastructure. The infrastructure minister has gone through the infrastructure portfolio very carefully to identify projects where sensible investments can be made, Order. Can be made that, that meet tests, like, for example, having a business case anywhere near the project. There are some projects funded under your uh, government when you were in power that didn't have uh, th those, that piece of work underpinning it. Uh, to go through, uh, to work with Infrastructure Australia, the business case that the Victorian government has done and I know that Thank Minister, Minister King is working with infrastructure. Senator Van, first supplementary. Thank you. The Victorian Auditor General said of the suburban rail loop, and I quote, the benefit cost ratio for the project is 0.51 when calculated in line with the DTF's guidance, below even the Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office rating of 0.6 Order. to 0.7. Minister, why is the government spending $2.2 billion on a project that demonstrably will not deliver value for money but will continue to overheat in the construction sector, pushing up prices for Victorians, contributing to inflation and making the cost of living crisis worse for Victorians. Thank you, Senator Van. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, again, I reject um, the assertions put in the question to me. The suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project. We are honouring we are honouring our election commitment. We are doing what we said we would do. Uh, we are delivering upon that election commitment. And that Order. project will transform how Victorians move around the state and reshape the way Victoria grows. Um, and I would say, in terms of cost of living um, relief, the budget provided cost of living relief in a way that is affordable and responsible and doesn't add to inflation. And I think you'll see from all of the um, assessment of the budget, uh, find somebody who, um, and all of the economists and that that have assessed the budget who said that the budget in itself does not add to inflation and cost of living relief was provided where it was affordable and uh, sustainable. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van, second supplementary. The October budget confirmed that the Albanese government was cut, cutting hospital funding in Victoria by $1.4 billion. Why is the Labor government supporting Premier Andrews boondoggle while at the same time making 
Oh, sorry. Uh, Senator uh, Premier McKenzie, uh, uh, Senator Van, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that remark. Uh, Madam President, um, I do withdraw calling our Premier uh, of Victoria. I do not repeat. Senate, no. Senator McKenzie, you know my rulings on these things, and I didn't think I would have to remind you not to repeat the offence. Simply withdraw the remark. I withdraw the remark. Thank you. Senator Van, please continue with your question and order on my right. Why is the Labor government supporting the member for Mulgrave's boondoggle while at the same time making his health crisis even worse by cutting funding to Victorian hospitals. Thank you, Senator Van. Minister. Uh, thank you. And um, I almost feel sorry for Senator Van being asked, asked to ask that question uh, because those who wrote it know very well that there is no cut to health funding in Victoria, that they know very well what has happened there. Uh, we look forward to working with the Victorian government and we look forward to a re-elected uh, Dan Senator Andrews Wong. government. Uh, after Saturday's election to deliver on these important infrastructure commitments, um, to work in partnership with them. Remember that, where you have federal and state governments working together in the interests of the nation. Uh, we look forward to that. We look forward to continuing that, delivering on our election commitments, working with the Victorian government on infrastructure and, importantly, on health to make sure that Australians have the health care system and the infrastructure they deserve from governments that are mature enough and responsible enough to work together. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. President, my question is for the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Murray Watt. Minister Watt. Right now in Victoria, the Andrews government is logging four MCGs worth of native forest every day. The Victorian government pledged to end native forest logging by 2030 and protect 9,000 hectares of old growth forests. But a damning expose by the ABC last week found that the state owned logging operator Vic Forests is continuing to log old growth forests that were marked for protection. And this is on top of two court findings in the last month that found that Vic forests were illegally logging forests that was home to two threatened species, greater gliders and tree g-bungs. Minister, what is the federal government and you as minister doing to ensure that Victoria's native forests are actually being protected? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. And thank uh, you. Senator yeah, Watt. It sort Senator, of feels like a Victorian Senator, election week Senator this Watt, week, doesn't please it? Please resume your seat. I would ask all senators, in particular Senator Scar and Senator Thorpe, to be quiet while the minister uh, answers the question. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And yes, it, clearly it's Victorian election week, and clearly there's a couple of parties who are scrambling for votes rather than getting on with the job of governing, which is what we are doing, and what uh, what the Andrews government is doing in Victoria right now. Uh, now, I, I, I have met with Senator Rice about forestry issues, and I understand that these are things that you um, uh, care about very sincerely. And as I have explained to Senator Rice, uh, what our, the Albanese Labor government does support a sustainable forestry industry. We respect the fact that there are some states who have made decisions about phasing out native forestry, others have not. Uh, the reality is that our country is in a position at the moment with a massive timber shortage uh, and, and potentially other related shortages. And there are other, other parts of the country who, who have chosen uh, to continue with native forestry at the moment, including Tasmania, and that is something that we support. That is their right to do that. Uh, but, uh, but, of course, Senator Rice is well aware um, that in, in states like Victoria we have a regional forestry agreement process underway. Uh, which, 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 le which leaves a lot of the management of those forestries to states. There's obviously been litigation about these matters recently, with courts having things to say about that. And I know the Victorian government is taking those decisions seriously. Um, but what the, what the Albanese government is doing is trying to strike a balance between the need for a forestry industry to provide the wood and timber and paper products that we need, Senator while also McKenzie. making sure that we are protecting the environment. That's why we went to the election with a big commitment to expand the plantation estate uh, in, in Australia and, and plant Senator more Wisconsin. trees through plantations to provide that timber. But the reality is uh, that in many, many parts of the country at the moment, the native forestry industry plays an important role in meeting that supply, and we support the people who work at that industry. So we think that that's a balanced approach, uh, and we think that that's the one that Australians want to see. 
Uh, Senator Rice, first supplementary. Minister, when it comes to protecting the critically endangered ecosystem of mountain ash forests, scientists tell us that 2030 is way too late. They will be pretty much logged out by then. At the recent climate conference, Australia joined the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership to increase action towards last year's COP commitment to strengthen our efforts to conserve forests and accelerate their restoration. How are you going to bring Victoria into line so we can deliver on this international commitment? Will you amend the EPBC Act to ensure that that's Thank the case? Thank you, Senator Rice. Your time has expired. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Rice. As Senator Rice is well aware, the way the RFA system, the Regional Forest Agreement system, works is that it essentially displaces the EPBC in relation to forestry uh, endeavours and has its own system of managing the environmental needs uh, of, those, of those forests. Uh, we, and that is a system that we continue to support. Senator Rice is all, also aware that the Victorian government has made decisions about the future of its native forests. As I say, we respect the, their right to make those decisions, but we do support the ongoing uh, efforts in other parts of the country to, to pursue native forestry, including in Tasmania, uh, which is what they've chosen to do. Uh, we are trying, as I say, to strike a balanced approach which meets the forestry needs and the timber needs of our country, supports the workers in those regional communities, while also maintaining environmental protections. Uh, Senator Rice asked about the EP EPBC. Again, she would be well aware that the EPBC and the Samuels Review is currently being considered by the government, and we'll have more to say about that before too long. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. A week after COP27, and amongst record-breaking climate-fueled floods across the country, there's been, never been a more important time for climate action. A Victorian Forest Alliance report found that native forest logging in Victoria emits around 3 million tonnes of carbon per year, and that's the equivalent of 700,000 calves. What's the federal government doing to ensure native forests in Victoria are protected and that native forest logging isn't worsening our climate crisis? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Um, well, again, if Senator Rice may have noticed that only last week at the COP conference, Australia joined 25 other nations in signing up to the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership. Um, and again, that is another demonstration of our, uh, our determination to ensure that forestry is conducted uh, in an environmentally sustainable manner. That is the intent of the RFAs. That is the yeah, intent um, of the policies that we've pursued. Uh, if, if particular forestry operations don't do the right thing, then they, that they will suffer the consequences of that. And that's what we've seen as a result of some of that litigation at the moment. Uh, but we are not going to stray beyond our responsibilities in the forestry space. Um, these are joint exercises between the federal and the state government. And as I say, look at our election commitments, look at our budget, which delivered over $200 million towards forestry, in particular plantation timber, while also making sure that we're providing workers with training and increasing the efficiency of native forestry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please inform the Senate how women will benefit from the reforms in the Secure Jobs and Better Pay Bill? Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Pratt, and um, I thank you for the question and for your uh, interest, uh, long-standing interest in gender equality and achieving gender equality in this country. The Secure Job Better Pay Bill will deliver on uh, the Albanese government's commitment to a fairer workplace relations system, which provides Australians with job security, gender equality and sustainable wage growth. For nearly a decade, wages were kept low as a deliberate design feature of the f previous government's management of the economy. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will take long overdue steps to promote gender equality and promote pay and secure work for women. The bill puts gender equality at the heart of the Fair Work system by making gender equality and job security objects of the Fair Work Act. It will make it easier for working women in undervalued industries to win a pay equity claim before the Commission by removing the need to find a male comparator and by making clear that sex discrimination is not necessary to establish that work has been undervalued. The bill will establish a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel in the Fair Work Commission, supported by $20 million in funding from the October bu budget. It will provide greater access for bargaining for lower paid 
and feminised sectors through the supported bargaining stream. Yeah, yeah. It will increase pay transparency by pro prohibiting pay secrecy clauses and strengthen access to flexible working arrangements so families can better share and manage their caring responsibilities. And where the previous government refused to act, this bill will prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, a recommendation of the Respect at Work report. Uh, President, women have waited far too long for their work to be properly valued, to get better access to flexible work and to feel safe and respected at work. Thank you, Minister. They the should not have to wait has any expired. longer. Senator Pratt's first can, the, can the minister outline how multi-employer bargaining will help close the gender pay gap? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the question because the gender pay gap continues to sit at 14.1 per cent. I think all of us on this side of the chamber agree that that is unacceptable, that women go to work, they work hard and they earn less than uh, men in the workplace. We must address the gender pay gap Thank if we're you. going to have a gender equal Australia. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will provide greater access to bargaining for low-paid, highly feminised sectors such as the community sector, cleaning and early childhood education and care. Employees on enterprise agreements earn, on average, more than employees on awards. For example, in the female-dominated health care and social assistance industry, employees on awards are earning 19 per cent less in average hourly earnings than employees on collective agreements. We must pass these laws so we can improve uh, the pay rates for women in these industries. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Can the minister outline how these reforms align with the government's broader efforts to advance gender equality? Thank you, Senator Pratt, Minister. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Senator Pratt. And yes, I can. The reforms are just one aspect of this government's ambition for Australia to be a leader on gender equality. Our budget put gender equality front and centre, investing over $7 billion in initiatives that will drive gender equality in this country. We are modernising paid parental leave and investing in cheaper childcare. We introduced paid domestic violence leave. We supported wage increases for workers on minimum wages and in aged care. We are taking action to strengthen gender pay reporting. We will implement all recommendations of the Respect at Work report. We will keep the focus on gender equality through a national strategy to achieve uh, gender equality, the work which has started uh, now and will be finished in the first half of next year. We also have the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, led by Sam Melston and uh, 12 other amazing women who are putting their shoulder to the wheel to make sure that we uh, can respond to the work that they do uh, on assisting us to uh, address uh, economic inequality you, for women. Senator Pocock. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Minister Farrell. Australians rightly celebrate when we lead the world. We are rightly proud when we punch above our weight on the world stage in many things. But leading the world in gambling losses on a per capita basis is not something to celebrate. Australians lose some $25 billion every year gambling. Does the government agree that we need strong and decisive action to protect children and vulnerable people from the harmful effects of gambling and gambling advertising? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pocock for his question and his courtesy in uh, giving us some advance uh, notice uh, of that uh, question. Um, look, you rightly, um, uh, you rightly uh, set out the um, uh, amount that uh, Australians uh, lose um, each year uh, through, uh, uh, through gambling, and uh, uh, that obviously is a very significant, uh, significant amount of money. Um, the government uh, is concerned um, about uh, the impact of, uh, of gambling uh, on, uh, on children, and uh, we've done uh, a number of things since uh, coming to um, uh, government uh, in this uh, respect. Um, uh, the government uh, recently established a uh, parliamentary uh, inquiry into uh, gambling and uh, its uh, impact on uh, uh, gambling harm. Um, one of the uh, key focus areas of the uh, parliamentary inquiry is considering the effectiveness of current gambling advertising restrictions 
particularly on limiting uh, children's exposure uh, to gambling products and services, including through uh, social uh, media. I am aware of uh, <coughs> gambling-like games, for instance, the video games that include uh, loot boxes and social uh, gaming, and they're of concern to uh, many, con uh, many uh, com uh, community members, um, and uh, work is being done <coughs> um, on this issue and uh, obviously will be part of the focus of the parliamentary inquiry that uh, I referred to uh, earlier. The Office of uh, the eSafety Commissioner has a guide on its website for parents about gaming, including those with gambling-like elements. Thank you, Minister. Elements. Your time has expired. <coughs> Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister. Uh, an ABC investigation last year revealed that the gambling industry has donated $80 million to polit political parties over the last 22 years. Given what we know about uh, gambling and its effect on society, does the minister believe it is still appropriate for any political party to accept donations from industries that make profit from gambling, given the effect on society? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. And again, thank uh, the uh, Senator uh, Pocock for his, uh, his question and uh, the uh, information that he has uh, provided to uh, the Senate. Um, look, um, the uh, the Labor Party is very seriously interested in uh, the reform of the, uh, the electoral uh, process. Um, and uh, of course, we have uh, <coughs> sent uh, a number of recommendations to the uh, parliamentary committee that looks after um, uh, the issue of uh, electoral funding, funding, the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Electoral uh, Matters. Um, some of the things that uh, I have um, proposed as the minister responsible in that area have been things like um, reducing the, uh, the uh, threshold levels for the disclosure of, um, uh, of donations. So at the moment, the figure is. The Thank figure you, minister. Is, the figure Your time is... has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Order. Thank you, Order. President. Thank you, Minister. Uh, how, how will the government ensure? that no child is subjected to ga gambling advertising, whether that's on social media or in the broadcasting of live sports events. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. But Walsh was gaining. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Again, thank uh, uh, Senator Pocock for his uh, concern uh, in, no, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, I actually didn't sort of finish my previous uh, answer, unfortunately, and I'll just say that um, uh, one of the things that we're proposing to do is, in that space is, is uh, uh, real-time disclosure of, uh, of donations. Um, the issue that you raise about uh, harm on children, um, we have set up um, an inquiry, um, as I mentioned uh, in one of my earlier answers, uh, Senator Pocock, um, and I would hope that yourself and other members of the uh, Senate who have got an interest uh, in this area um, will take the opportunity of that inquiry um, to bring the sorts of issues that uh, you have uh, quite rightly uh, raised uh, here today. Um, bring that to the uh, the committee so that so that that committee uh, can Senator look at Thor. these issues uh, and you, deal Minister. with them Your in a sensible fashion. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I would ask that you not uh, continue with those interjections. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Minister, yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Cash, you said, and I quote, we are dealing with an inflation challenge at the moment, and no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation, end quote. Can you confirm it's the government's position that you don't expect wages uh, to grow uh, at the pace of inflation? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I... <laughs> The point I was making yesterday, and I, I thank um, the senator for the question, was that we don't expect wages to grow at the rate of inflation as it currently is now. You'll see from the budget papers, I think it's in the 24-25 financial year, that we are expecting wages uh, to move ahead of inflation. Um, but what we, well, well, that is what the budget papers say. Um, but I was, I was responding 
to a question uh, about uh, wages moving. Well, what I was responding to was wages moving at the rate of inflation as, inf as inflation currently is. Uh, and I think you wouldn't find anybody, including on your side, that would be arguing for wage increases uh, in the order of 8 per cent. I wouldn't imagine, because that will cause other problems uh, that we are trying to avoid. Wages at the moment are not impacting on inflation. Inflation is being uh, largely contributed to, or the increase in inflation is down to energy costs caused by the, way, uh, the war in Ukraine and by uh, some of those supply chain issues, shortages that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so we are taking a responsible position in relation to wages. We want to get wages moving. That's why we have the industrial relations bill before the parliament. We want to see an end of uh, the wage stagnation decade that was overseen by the former government. Uh, we've made no secret that we want to deal with wage inequality in low-paid, feminised industries, uh, and the budget papers outline clearly the wage forecasts over the forward estimates that they will remain below inflation for the first two years, and then they will gradually uh, increase to a point where they just uh, increase above inflation Thank in that you, third year. Senator Fawcett, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. The Australian public are also dealing with the reality of the current situation, where they are seeing costs going up, and they will recall the promise made before the election this year, on the 11th of May, by the now Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, who said, and I quote, Labor wants to make sure that wages keep pace with the cost of living, end quote. So can you confirm, Minister, that Labor has abandoned that promise to the Australian people made before Thank the election you, Senator Fawcett. to Your keep pace with the cost? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister. Thank you. And I think you'll see from our budget papers we do want uh, workers to get wage, uh, wage increases that help them deal with the cost of living. No, so that uh, the uh, senator is incorrect when he asserts that. There has been no change in position from this government. We are dealing with an inflation problem in this country right now, though, in case anyone over there hadn't noticed. Oh, if you haven't noticed, noticed. Right, you've noticed. noticed, have you? OK. Order. All right. Order. Well, just the reality here is that we are trying to deal with the inflation challenge and we are, in a sensible and responsible way, dealing with the after effects of a decade of wage stagnation. You are the party of wage stagnation. So the nerve of you to stand up and challenge us uh, on our Minister, position to get wages moving is seat. a bit— Senator Henderson. Uh, um, thank you, Madam President. Once and again, I would draw uh, the minister's attention to the fact that she needs to make her comments through the chair. Uh, I you. believe the minister is mostly making her comments to the chair. Uh, I would also ask those on my left to uh, stop calling out. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And in fact, in the last six months since we uh, came into government. We have done a number of things, and I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to, to continue on this, including supporting increases to the minimum Thank wage you, that Minister. you never Your did. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, second supplementary. Thank you, President. I again go to the Australian public's expectation there will be consistency before and after the election. On the 20th of May, the now Prime Minister said, and I quote, it's not bad luck, it's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living, end quote. Uh, Minister, will you now also label this situation your bad policy that wages are not keeping up with inflation rather than blaming circumstances? Thank you, Senator uh, Fawcett. Minister. That's right. Don't deal with the, don't deal with the economic uh, reality right now. But I would say, in response to that question, vote for the Industrial Relations Bill. Vote for it. That's the single biggest thing you could do right now to help us get Order. wages moving. Order. That's what you should do. You've overseen a decade of wage stagnation. You're now saying you want Order. to see wages keep up with the cost of living. Well, support with us. Walk with us. Stop being the party of work choices. Stop being the party that want to keep wages down. Remember that? Stop, stop wanting to make uh, childcare, aged care workers, those on minimum wage, not get a decent pay rise. Stop arguing about things. When in government you had that section about 
uh, the importance of low paid work, a whole section in your submission to the Fair Work Commission. Yeah, That's your wages. record. We're yeah, trying to get wages, wages moving. We proudly stand Jeez. next to working people to argue for that and join with us and support the legislation. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. Minister, the government secure jobs better pay bill abolishes the Australian Building and Construction Commission. What problems are solved by specifically abolishing the ABCC that aren't actually caused by the code it is meant to enforce, which your government has already acted on? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Lambie would be well aware that for a number of years uh, leading into the last election, it was Labor's clear policy to abolish the ABCC. And that was because uh, it had completely failed workers in the building industry and firms in the building industry as well. Um, Senator Lambie, or through, through the President, Senator Lambie, uh, I'm, if you haven't already received, seen these statistics, I'm happy to show you the figures that show that the entire time the ABCC was in existence, productivity on building sites actually fell. It went backwards. So for all the claims that were made that it was going to be the solution to productivity and drive the industry forward, the facts actually show that the industry went backwards in productivity. Uh, and that's let alone um, the gross waste of taxpayers' money that we saw under the ABCC pursuing trivial matters through the courts. And we just, we just went through it again at Estimates oh, yeah. recently. We just went through it again at Estimates recently about the legal expenditure. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Order. I remind those on my left, this is Senator Lambie's question. She has the right to hear the answer in silence. As you're well aware, everyone in this chamber is aware, the crossbenchers do not get the same opportunity as the major parties to ask questions. And I would ask those to be courteous and allow Senator Lambie to hear the answer in silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, President and, and Senator Lambie, I can assure you that this government does take uh, workplace conduct, whether it be from workers, from businesses, from, from unions, very seriously. And that's why, under the system that we're proposing, the Fair Work Ombudsman uh, will have a range of powers to take action where that's warranted. I guess our fundamental point is that we don't think that different workers should be treated differently. We should have one regulator of conduct on work sites. Uh, and that is the Fair Work Ombudsman. We don't need uh, an additional body for one industry that pursues workers and pursues unions and leaves employers alone, when we all know uh, that in the building industry there are rogue employers as well. The ABCC never did anything about that. It did very little to recover underpayments to workers, a very serious issue. Uh, and we think the Fair Work Ombudsman is the appropriate place to, to do that work. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I understand that the Labor Party and the union movement doesn't like the fact that the ABCC has busy, busied itself policing flags and stickers. I agree. Regulators shouldn't be distracted by small beer infringements like that. But you can fix that with a tighter building code. The CFMMEU has made it clear it will continue to breach laws it does not agree with. That's not restricted to stickers and flags. Does your government not believe in the need for a building code at all? Thank you, Senator Lambie. And Minister Watt, I'll just remind you to make your remarks to the chair. Through the chair, Please. certainly. Um, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, President, the, the building code, again, uh, was another example of this government having a very one-sided, uh, the former government having a very one-sided attitude uh, towards conduct on building sites. Uh, the building code was a, a, was a part of the arsenal of the ABCC, which was used to crack down on unions and workers and do nothing about the abuse of workers and unions on construction sites. What we're in favour of is a balanced approach from a regulator that applies across all industries, so that whether you're a hospitality worker or a childcare worker or a, or a truckie, Senator Stirl, or a construction worker, I know, I know truckies always behave. Um, I remember that from my days representing the TWU. Um, the, um, but whatever, whatever industry it is, people deserve to be treated equally. Uh, and the building, uh, the building code was another part of that arsenal, and that's why we've repealed it. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Madam President, the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill transfers some of the power from the OBCC to the Fair Work Ombudsman, but doesn't transfer all of its budget. 
It's being asked to do more without the money to do it. Something's got to give here. What safeguards will you put in place so the Fair Work Ombudsman doesn't have to choose between its core business like policing wage theft and policing the industry? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, President, and thanks again, Senator Lambie. Again, I remember from the estimates uh, hearings which we recently conducted, uh, evidence was given about a, a number of positions from the ABCC moving across to the Fair Work, work Ombudsman. Um, so they are being given extra resources to pursue whether it be employers, unions, workers who are doing the wrong thing on work sites. Uh, so I'm very confident that the Fair Work Ombudsman does have the resources to pick up some of those roles that the ABCC previously uh, played. Um, what we're about is making sure um, that important things that are actually reasonable in a workplace setting get pursued by the Fair Work Ombudsman, and all the nonsense and politicisation that the ABCC was given taxpayers' funding for, that is what is going to end. And I think that's what, us, that's what people voted for. We could not have been clearer in the lead-up to the election that we were going to abolish the ABCC. Uh, we feel that we've got a mandate to implement that reform now, along with all the other reforms that we've, we're planning to implement. Um, and I'm out of time. Thank you, Minister. What, Senator Green? Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the Minister update the Senate on developments in the human rights situation in Iran overnight and the response by Iranians themselves? Minister. Thank you um, to Senator Green. I thank her for uh, her interest in this matter and for her, her solidarity with the women and men of Iran who have been standing against uh, the repressive and violent actions of the regime. And I acknowledge uh, that that is uh, a position shared by, uh, I hope, all uh, in this chamber, but certainly uh, many across the chamber have been also raising their voices. I know that people would have been following events in Iran closely. Uh, and I think all of us would have been moved by the image overnight of the Iranian football team standing silent during the Iranian regime's anthem. And this was a courageous act, a courageous act. By refusing to, and by refusing to sing the anthem, they're actually joining a chorus, they're joining a chorus in Iran and around the world that has grown steadily louder over the last two months. And while the Iranian soccer team staged their protest, protests within Iran continued, especially in majority Kurdish areas, and so did the regime's brutal response. That response included attacking protesters using machine guns mounted on vehicles and even using drones, missiles, and the death toll now runs well into the hundreds. We all know that this started on September 16th with the death of Masa Amini, whose Kurdish name was Jinnah. Uh, her unexplained death in the custody of the so-called morality police was a spark that lit a flame of protest that has spread across Iran and to the streets of cities around the world, including Australia. Protest activity has make it, ma taken many forms, street demonstrations, women and girls removing their hijabs with others also cutting off their hair. In solidarity with protesters, Iranian shopkeepers, factory workers and employees in the oil and petrochemical sectors have participated in strikes, and we saw Iranian archer Parmida Ghassimi remove her hijab in a sign Thank of solidarity Senator, during an award expired. ceremony in Texas. Senator Green's first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how has the government responded to these developments overnight? Thank you, Senator Green, Minister. Thank you. With with new reports of violence and retaliation against those expressing their right to protest, this morning the Australian government again called in Iran's chargé d'affaires, and I welcomed the opposition's meeting with the chargé a few weeks ago. It is important that Australia speaks with one voice in conveying the abhorrence of these events. And as Iranian authorities have brutally cracked down on protesters, this country has joined in the international condemnation. We have made a number of international in interventions, including supporting the convening of a special session of the Human Rights Council on the situation in Iran, which will take place this week. We provided early co-sponsorship of a resolution calling for a fact-finding mission, and we will advocate intensively to build support for it. Just as the Iranian representative was left in no doubt, the Senate should be clear of this government's resolve to continue working with others to build pressure on the regime to cease its brutal campaign against its own thank citizens. You, um, Senator Green, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. 
What can the government say to Australians who are concerned about reports of harassment and foreign interference by the Iranian regime? Minister. Uh, uh, I certainly am, and I have no doubt that all senators would be deeply concerned with the reports of Australians here in Australia being harassed for their participation in protests and the reported threats made against their families in Iran. You see, of course, the right to peaceful protest is at the heart of Australia's democracy. The, our concerns were relayed in no uncertain terms to the Iranian Chargé d'Affaires this morning, and the Department of Home Affairs Counter Foreign Interference Coordination Centre is working with the community to conduct target engagement in for, on foreign interference. My message to anyone involved in such activities is this. Australia's laws on foreign interference are unequivocal. Allegations of foreign interference are investigated, and we will prosecute if appropriate. We will defend our democracy and people's right to protest and express their views within Australia, just as we stand up for the rights of those to do so Thank you, elsewhere. Mr. Wong, your time is six five. Uh, Senator Dunning. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Wong. And I refer to reports in The Australian today revealing that Ms Plibersek's decision on 4 November to review 18 previous ministerial approvals of coal and gas projects may cost 174,000 Australians their jobs and cause the loss of $100 billion worth of investment in our country. Has the government modelling has, has the government done any modelling on the economic and social impacts of these decisions? And if so, what does the modelling actually say? Thank you, Senator Daniam. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question, uh, Senator Daniam. I, I infer from the question, uh, and I don't have the detailed information before me, I may have at any point in this answer, and, um, uh, that this is a review on, in the context of Ms Plibersek's statutory role. Uh, as such, uh, I wouldn't be responding to uh, assertions by others about what might or might occur, but not, might not occur in the context of that review. And obviously the government wouldn't be in a position of modelling hypotheticals. Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Given the decision to review these uh, projects has come about because of legal action of Environmental Justice Australia, a group set to benefit from the recent budget in a share of nearly $10 million of government funding to continue to appeal coal and gas projects, Will the government review its decision to hand taxpayers' money to organisations jeopardising jobs and projects helping to supply our energy? Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister Wong. Did, she, did he actually say who they were? Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you actually said the name of the entity, uh, but I would make the point that um, we live in a country where there is the rule of law uh, and funding entities or people uh, to, uh, who then may use their rights under the rule of law and exercise them. Uh, that is what happens in a democracy which respects the rule of law. Senator Dunningham, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. I've got no issue with the rule of law, but I do have an issue with taxpayers' money being used this way. How can the government honestly tell Australians it is for lower power prices and more Australian jobs when it is actually funding groups engaged in green lawfare, jeopardising much needed jobs and, of course, projects that supply our energy? Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister. I, I think, if, we, if I may say, Senator Dunham, and I understand why he's asking the question, there were a lot of non secretaries there. Uh, the the uh, government has, um, uh, will apply uh, uh, its approach to environmental approvals under the law which exists, which is the same law as was applied under you. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't be commenting on any projects currently under assessment uh, by the minister uh, now or in the future. And with that, if I may, I'd ask that further questions be placed on notice. And I would also ask, perhaps, if we could order. Uh, if I could seek leave to make a short statement in relation to. Um, the earthquake in West Java and an, and an earthquake in Solomon Thank Islands. I thank the Senate and I thank my colleague Senator Birmingham for uh, permitting us to do this. Can I start by saying the Australian government extends its deepest condolences to our neighbours in Indonesia following this, morning, this morning's magnitude 5.6 earthquake in West Java. It is clear there has been substantial loss of life and property. And the thoughts of all of us are with those killed and injured and their loved ones. 
I have been in touch this morning with my Indonesian counterpart, Iba Retno, uh, and the Australia stands ready to assist our Indonesian friends at this time. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is not currently aware of any Australians impacted. In the past two hours, uh, we have also been informed of a, informed of a magnitude 7 uh, on the Richter scale earthquake off the coast of the Solomon Islands. The situation is unfolding. I am advised that all Australian government personnel are safe and accounted for. DFAT is seeking to confirm the safety of other Australians in the Solomons and their families. There has been some minor damage to an annex building of Australia's High Commission. Staff were also moved to, a higher, gra to higher ground in response to the tsunami warning that was issued. I am informed that the warning has now passed and that the High Commission remains operational, and I thank all those at the post for their work. An Australian member of the Solomon Islands Assistance Force has been deployed to National Disaster Management Office to assist in coordination. We are a steadfast friend and partner to Solomon Islands, and we stand ready to support the Solomon, government's, Solomon Islands government response, and I have expressed that uh, to Minister Manelli. Can I say that anyone with concerns for any Australians uh, in either West Java or Solomon Islands can contact the Consular Emergency Centre on 1300 555 135 in Australia or plus 61262613305 outside Australia. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. Uh, President, uh, human tragedies and natural disasters remind us all that we live amongst a community of nations that is underpinned ultimately by a common sense of humanity. Uh, within our region, uh, the nations who we count as friends and partners are ones who we stand with during such times of difficulty. And we are aware that at least 162 individuals have lost their lives in the town of Tianjur, West Java, in Indonesia, following the earthquake there, many others injured and missing. Families, of course, torn apart, devastated and shattered, uh, and a community facing huge disruption and enormous rebuild. As Senator Wong has indicated, and I thank her for foreshadowing these remarks, more recently an earthquake in Solomon Islands, a situation still unfolding, but again a community facing uncertainty, including uh, from the potential threat of tsunami. Uh, these are all difficult times for the communities involved. The opposition joins the government in expressing our condolences to those who have lost loved ones, our full support uh, to Indonesia and to the Solomon Islands uh, as they deal with these difficulties. We extend also our support uh, to the DFAT officers and consular staff who will be working uh, with uh, people during these difficult times and also to the relief teams who no doubt have work to come and extend full bipartisanship in terms of any response that the government provides in support for Indonesia or the Solomon Islands. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Yeah. Senator Waters. Thank you. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Uh, leave is granted, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. I would like to join on behalf of the Australian Greens and extend our sympathies to those in West Java and uh, let the folk of uh, the Solomons know we are thinking of them. Uh, as, as in difficult times like this, Australia rises to the challenge, and I hope that our government um, will see some Australians out there to help very soon. And again, we are thinking of those in our region suffering right now. Thank you, Senator Waters. Ah, just a moment, Senator Colbeck, I'll just uh, get the deputy to come forward. Can I ask senators to please leave the chamber quietly before I give the call to Senator Colbeck? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of questions from coalition senators today to government ministers during question time. Mr. President, what the Australian people are seeing six months into the term of this new government is that what was said before the election doesn't necessarily apply after the election. But also how the Labor Party will continue to cynically and politically use their governance in relation to their relationships with the states. 
We've heard in relation to the Ring Road project, Suburb Ring Road, Ring Road project in and suburban rail in in, in Victoria, where the allocation of 2.2 billion dollars to that particular project, when the Victorian Auditor General questions its viability, continues to be there. And quite extraordinary that the current minister, Minister King, says that if it doesn't stack up through the Infrastructure Australia process, they'll just send it back until it does stack up. Now, how is that process? How is that good process? When Tasmania asked for some support for, for a stadium to support the AFL licence that's uh, coming our way, which is great news, the Prime Minister said that he wanted to see a business plan. When New South Wales was looking for support for infrastructure projects, there were significant cuts to infrastructure projects in New South Wales, although they were rephased out beyond the budget estimates. But when Victoria wants a project to suit its election timeline, even though the project has questionable economics, $2.2 billion of Australian taxpayers' money is funnelled into that in support of it, Mr President. There's, that, there's money funnelled into that, Mr President. So while Tasmania wants to see a stadium built to support an AFL side, that's too bad. But to su suit the political purposes of the, new, of the Victorian Brown, Labor can't, Party for their can't election campaign, $2.2 .2 billion can be found, Mr President. And we're seeing that in relation to cost of living, Mr President, before the election. No end of government or now government ministers, then opposition ministers, were out there in the public arena talking about how they would be working to support Australians with cost of living. In fact, the now Treasurer said on Sky Agenda on the 1st of May, that means under Labor you'll have a government which cares about cost of living and has plans to deal with it. Well, Mr President, what we're actually seeing is that there was no plan. There is no plan. Uh, and that's being demonstrated by the cost of living pressures that we're seeing now. The budget admits that electricity prices will go up by an excess of 50 per cent. The gas prices will go up by an excess of 35 per cent. Australians are coming to realise that they were sold a pup before the election with all the commitments that they were made around cost of living. In fact, as the opposition leader said in his address and reply to the budget, everything's going up except your wages. And the government's now admitting at that. They're crab walking away from all of their promises. They're just seeking to redefine their promises, or they're doing what they've done all along, is to blame somebody else. It's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's problem. But what's clear, Mr. President, uh, Deputy President, what's very, very clear is that Labor don't have a plan they never had a plan, despite saying dozens and dozens of times in the lead-up to the election that they did. But what Australians are realising now that just because they said it doesn't mean it was so. Doesn't mean it was so. And so, the cost of living continues to go up. The cost of your gas and electricity bills are continuing to grow up. Your tax payments are going up. Government spending's going up. And real wages are forecast to go down. This government made commitment after commitment after commitment to support Australians. They said they would be with them all the way. They would be beside Australians in dealing with the challenges of cost of living, uh, and they would support Australians to do that. They would support Australians in that risk. But what has become very apparent, Mr. President, what has become, Deputy President, what has become very apparent is that Australians are now on their own. Labor has no answers. Is crab working away from its commitments, and Australians are going to have to deal with these problems on their own. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Deputy President. Uh, look, I, it, it's very clear from the questions asked by the opposition and, and even the Greens today that there's a Victorian election on the horizon, and there's a focus from those parties. But on this side of the chamber, we are 
we are focused on delivering for Australians cost of living relief and higher wages, and that is what we are getting on with this week in Parliament. Uh, look, we certainly have a desire to work with state governments, and we know from the answers given from our ministers today that we are really keen to make sure that no matter which state we're talking about, we are working with states to deliver infrastructure projects. Foreign concept to those over there who made a sport out of um, picking sides with state governments and, and fighting state governments in the last term, uh, but we are interested in working together to deliver jobs and to deliver infrastructure. Now, it's pretty rich for those opposite to come in here and talk about infrastructure funding and decision making because we know that they are the party of the colour coded spreadsheets, whether it's car park rorts, safety rorts building rorts, sports rorts. There wasn't a fund that the former government didn't try to rort and use taxpayers' money as Liberal Party money. So we're not going to sit here and cop from the other side uh, debate about funding and decisions on f infrastructure funding. We are delivering our election commitments and we are going to be funding infrastructure and delivering integrity to infrastructure funding, funding projects that deliver value for money and deliver jobs for Australians. In Queensland alone, can I tell the Senate, we are delivering $18.5 billion in infrastructure funding. And before those over there uh, protest about the delivery of that funding, can I say that over half of that investment is in regional Queensland. I couldn't be prouder of the infrastructure commitments that we are delivering. And we're doing that in conjunction with the state government because we're working together in most places, all three levels of government to deliver these projects. But those on the opposite side of the chamber today come in here and accuse our government of walking away from promises on cost of living relief. And can I assure you, we are not doing that at all. We are delivering cost of living relief, whether it's cheaper childcare or cheaper medicines. But more importantly, we are also working very hard to deliver real pay rises to hardworking Australians. This is the party over there coming here, lecturing us about wage growth in high inflation when we know that the Liberal National Party were the party of low wages, literally in a submission to the Fair Work Commission, argued the benefit of keeping wages low for low wage workers. They had, they had a deliberate design feature in their approach to wage growth that tried to keep wages low. And it worked. Like, <laughs> The facts speak for themselves. After 10 years, we saw stagnant wages and low wages that didn't keep up with the cost of living. Stagnant wages have an impact on, on everyday cost of living, on families, on the food that they can put on the table, but they also have an impact on our economy. There's a reason that the economy went backwards under this mob, and it's because they refuse to understand that lifting wages lifters, lifts the economy. We've got a broken bargaining system, and uh, it is clear from every side of this debate, whether it's workers, whether it's unions, whether it is businesses, and it's really hard for those over there to hear those, those quotes from small and large businesses who acknowledge that the bargaining system is broken and it needs to be fixed. So can I assure those opposite who have raised concerns in their questions today and hopefully will raise them in their taking note speeches that if you are concerned about the wages of Australia's lowest paid workers and making sure that people can keep up with the cost of living, there's a very simple thing that you can do this week in Parliament or next. You can come in here and you can vote for our secure jobs and better pay bill because it is a bill that will deliver a fairer system, better wages and a better bargaining system. If you want to do that, you can join us in, in supporting workers, in supporting childcare workers, aged care workers, workers throughout the economy who you stood there and thanked during the pandemic for all the hard work that they did. Now you've got a chance to thank them to make sure that they have a pay rise that delivers on cost of living. You, you can Senator do that Green. next week in the Senate. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Aki. Um, sorry, Deputy President. Um, the questions we heard today in the chamber and the answers around the funding of the $2.2 billion suburban rail loop. Now, 
it was my first estimates. I'm new here, and I learned about this phrase of reprofiling of budgets and money and what we're going to put. So we're taking on a loop. It's <laughs> my first lesson. So what we're looking at is that money in the budget we have to take on faith. It's not printed. It's not written. It's there. It's like a Bitcoin transaction. It is on faith and it can disappear just as quickly. It can leave thousands of people without their jobs, thousands of people without their money. And this is what we're finding. But we do find this 2.2 billion in the budget for 24-25. And we see 1.4 billion coming from health. Now I go to the 2.2 billion. And in the question we said, the Victorian Auditor General found that the Victorian government did not demonstrate the economic rationale for the entire project. And they have told us they have no plans to do so. Now let's not think that 2.2 billion builds a suburban rail loop. It's up to $130 billion to build a suburban rail loop. What is that 2.2 billion for? Is that the down payment on a loan fee for Belton Road? Is that what it is? is what does this do in 24-25? We saw that on the Newcastle Sydney high, high speed rail promise of the government, where they put 500 million towards establishing a planning committee and buying property, but no rails will be laid no sleepers will be laid, no trains will be bought. Again, it is just money for nothing. People won't get from Newcastle to Sydney faster, people won't get around Melbourne faster, but we've put that money there to hang the hope out and the profiling will take care of the rest. When we talk about prices raising and cost of living, we always hear about the Ukraine situation and the price of gas. We hear the price of fuel, we hear the price of coal. But the majority of Australian coal-fired power plants have fixed-term contracts on their coal at about $100 a tonne. They haven't raised. A coal truck doesn't go via the mine, via Ukraine, via the Donbass, back to Australia to a coal-fired power station to produce it. Our gas doesn't get shipped overseas via the Caucasus back to Australia. And no wind turbine, no solar panel runs its wiring through the Ukraine back to Australia. They have put price pressure, but that's not to cover all the cost of living. That is domestic promises and a lack of policy that is driving these people's costs higher. And when you look at the opportunity cost of all this, that $2.2 billion again could have gone to ease this thing. I'm sure the rigorous processes that this government claimed was put on that $2.2 billion for the suburban rail loop took a shorter period than it takes to get an ambulance in Melbourne nowadays. People spend hours, it was last night talking about a child that waited an hour and a half and put on hold while they waited to get an ambulance. What could have that $2.2 billion done for those people down there? What could have it done for cost of living at home? What could it do in so many ways? But it appears people can't buy energy anymore, but is there a fear that these $2 billion can try and buy an election? And remember, this was an election that was meant to be easily done. This was a mention that was going to be a walk in the park. But through all the fog and mirrors and everything that's going on, it's becoming a tussle. It is not a own goal. It's not another Premier Dan Andrews cakewalk. This will be close because the people of Australia are having enough of pushing reprofiling projects to the never never, promising bits of money that will never see a project. They're having enough of seeing interest rates go up eight times since this government was elected. They're having enough of seeing energy prices predicted go up 53% and then 30%. The, the people of Victoria and the people of Australia want to see action. And we can hear you point the finger if we did anything in the last decade. And I get it, we don't have power anymore, but we've had a budget. There was an opportunity not to do everything, but to do more. It hasn't done it. All it has done is come up with things that were promised, not research properly, not going to help the people in the, the, the areas they need right now, and we need to do better. There needs to be another thing that comes in shortly to help people with the cost of living. We need to relook at this suburban rail loop and give people the things they need, like money on health, money on living, and we, that's what we should be focusing on. Thank you. Senator Krogan. Thank you. Um, it was interesting to sit here and listen to Senator Fawcett blaming the Labor government 
for the stagnated wages and the challenges we have in cost of living pressures in Australia at the moment. Seriously? You spend nine years in government presiding over these things with an absolutely dedicated policy of suppressing wages that have been really clear about that, and you want to blame us, you want to blame the Labor government after six months for those pressures. That is just absolutely ridiculous. So let's just be really clear. In six months, in six short months, we have moved to, to work on cheaper childcare. We have a bill in front of us. We've increased renewable energy and we have a plan for our electricity system into the future that is going to make a difference, that is going to improve how we can utilise renewable energy in this country. We have introduced the, the free TAFE places to address the skills shortages that we have been stuck with for years now and that are only getting worse. We have looked. We are bringing in extra university places to also address those same skills shortages. And as we heard earlier uh, from Senator Gallagher, there's been 32 billion in increased payments, including into the um, age pension. All of these things to address the cost of living pressures and the employment pressures that we have, the skills gap, etc. And we have also increased the minimum wage. Well, we didn't, but we supported it, and we have encouraged that to occur. And now we have, and we are on the verge of the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill that will make a difference if those in this room, this chamber, would pass it. Support us getting behind having wages moving, moving so that people are not struggling under the stagnated, wage, stagnated wages that we have seen from the opposition while they are in government for very nine very, very long years. So we are taking action and we are going to make a difference. The problems we are facing um, with the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill are ones of ideology in the main. Now, I am uh, I'm honoured enough to sit on the Employment Education Standing Committee, which is looking at this bill. And we have had an inquiry which has had five days of hearings. And just to be clear, that's more public hearings than any other workplace relations related bill since the introduction of the Fair Work Act. And that committee has heard from employers, it has heard from unions, it has heard from the community, it has heard from small business, it has heard from workers, it has heard from not for profit organisations, from the Department of Employment and also from the Fair Work Commission um, to ensure that each member of the committee has had a chance to unpack the bill, to explore the issues. And that is exactly what has happened. But one of the common things that we're hearing now is that small business are going to struggle and are going to suffer here. We are hearing all sorts of outlandish claims about there being um, strikes from coast to coast, I think was the comment from Senator Cash. And there is nothing, nothing in these bills that would see us would see that happen in that small in any environment, but certainly not in that small business area. Even when there was 60 per cent um, union density, it was never in small business. Small business has never had a deep union uh, unionisation. And there's nothing in these bills that's going to change that. And when we go to the other end of the scale, where we have the big end of town coming and talking to us, particularly some of those areas where they're never going to see any impacts from this. Their businesses are in a situation where they have their wages settled, they've been bargaining, everything's going nicely. This bill isn't going to change that. This bill is not going to change that. This bill is going to get wages moving. It is going to address some significant cost of living pressures that we are facing in this country, and it is going to give a fair go for the workers, not just allow the big employers, the medium employers, the employers without any morals, to keep moving to a low-wage environment. This is about everybody having a go, from the businesses Thank to you, the employers. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, 
I rise to take note of the, the first two questions that were, were asked uh, by the coalition in, in uh, question time today, and uh, note that they were about the suburban rail project. And uh, I don't think we heard uh, any contribution by uh, by the Labor senators that have stood up here during take note uh, that actually made even a glancing reference to. Uh, to those particular questions. I could have taken a point of order on that, uh, Deputy President, but uh, I, uh, I didn't because I just thought this is going to be interesting to see if they're continuing to avoid, I guess, the point uh, that, that was being raised by those questions. And of course, that point is all about integrity, transparency, and sound economic management because uh, this uh, Andrews Labor government suburban rail loop is just another. Uh, example of, uh, of this government's uh, failed budget and their utter hypocrisy. Because whenever Labor's in political trouble, they always go to look to rail to haul them out of, uh, the, of, of a fix. And so they're at it again. The suburban rail loop's estimated spend of $125 million, the, the price tag of just two legs of the project, and it won't even be completed by 2050. Yet the Prime Minister had to step in and help out his old mate there, uh, the Victorian Premier. The federal government committed uh, to a $2.2 billion spend at their October budget, almost a, a quarter of their infrastructure spend. Now, this is pork barrelling at its absolute finest. As usual, Labor are putting their priorities over Australians' priorities. Never mind the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, the, the out of control inflation that we're experiencing right now in this country. Labor is happy to scrap uh, excellent programs such as the Building Better Region Fund. But of course, that is only so that they can afford to commit to a project that hasn't even had its business case approved by Infrastructure Australia. Uh, as reported by the Australian Financial Review, I quote, Victoria's Auditor-General has criticised the Andrew government's 400-page business case, which had declined to submit to Infrastructure Australia for failing to demonstrate that the economic costs and benefits of the project justify the investment. Now, in my home state of Western Australia, uh, Premier Mark McGowan's signature Metronet, Metronet project uh, that he committed to at the 2017 election is also facing uh, major cost blowouts and significant delays. And Senator Brockman uh, is here. He knows that the delays that have been experienced uh, right across uh, right across that Metronet uh, project. And and what we're seeing is that the the Albanese Labor government has ripped out 1.2 billion dollars from the budget that had been earmarked for a very important project that was determined by Infrastructure Australia. Infrastructure Australia as a one of the key infrastructure projects that was necessary for the productivity uh, to be driven uh, in in uh, in my home state of Western Australia, uh, and that was the, of course the Row 8 Row 9 project and the the, the freight link that uh, was was earmarked in the budget uh, for uh, for quite some time, waiting for a government in Western Australia to commit to it. But they have failed, uh, failed to do that, sadly. And in fact, they've ripped it out of the budget, and it's no longer there available for a government that would choose in Western Australia to build that important project. And they've just instead got these ridiculous projects up and down Leach Highway that uh, are not actually resolving the, the congestion and the traffic issues, and, and importantly, taking uh, heavy freight off those routes. Uh, through suburban areas, through suburban streets, uh, the, the, whereas Row 8 and 9 would have uh, created a thoroughfare for large trucks, for large heavy freight uh, to be able to get in and out. And so uh, we're seeing uh, in, in, in Victoria, obviously, the election's coming uh, this Saturday, and, uh, and there the, the Victorian people have a, a big decision to make this Saturday. And, and what we're seeing is that this uh, federal government, federal Labor, is doing everything it can to help protect uh, uh, the Premier there in, uh, in, uh, in, in Victoria to, to try and help him to be able to uh, win back another government. But this, what we know is that the only 
real way that that uh, state can really move past the, the situation that uh, they've found themselves in after, after quite some considerable time, particularly over this last period, over the COVID period. Uh, we know that the only opportunity to be able to do that is to be able to see a Liberal elected government there, which is going to help them fix their budget mess and help them fix their infrastructure projects. I put the question though for the question say aye against no the ayes have it. Senator Rice, you seek the call. I do. Thank you, um, Deputy President. I move to take note of Minister Watts' answer to my question on native forest logging. And this is something that is close to my heart. I have been campaigning for decades to end the destructive logging of Australia's native forests, and particularly Victoria's. And sadly, the minister's answer shows that Labor just don't get it. The minister talked of balance, of sustainable forestry. I mean, let me translate that for you. What that means is ongoing forest destruction. What that means is the death of hundreds of endangered greater gliders in illegal operations, logging operations undertaken by the state-owned logging company, Vic Forests. What balance and sustainable forestry means is the ongoing emissions every year of three million tonnes of carbon, the equivalent of 700,000 cars, while we're in a climate crisis, as the devastating floods around the country are reminding us of at the moment, as the black summer fires three years ago were all too stark a reminder of the climate crisis that we're in. In a few days from now, voters in Victoria have a choice they have a choice between very different approaches to our native forests. The Labor Party has failed comprehensively at both state and federal levels to protect Victoria's precious native forests. They make vague promises about ending native forest logging, but the time frame is so far away that vast swathes of forests and the animals that rely upon them are going to be gone by the time that 2030 time comes around, at the rate of four MCGs worth of forests every day. They say that the forests are being managed jointly, but the Labor federal government is doing nothing about the Labor Vic Forest illegal logging, refusing to pull the Victorian Labor government into line. Minister Watt made no commitments to get rid of the logging laws our regional forest agreements that allow this logging to continue. He made no commitment to make changes to our environment laws, the EPBC Act, to better protect our forests. The Vic Labor government and the Vic federal government are working in cahoots to allow the ongoing devastation of our native forests and the wildlife that depend upon them. The Greens have got a different vision. We have a clear policy of ending native forest logging. We want to see a just transition, one that provides clean, green jobs that are sustainable for both workers and the environment. We want to see people working in protecting our forests, in ecological restoration, in revegetation, tackling weeds and pest animals, on disaster management and relief, people employed growing trees in plantations and on farm forestry, so that 100 per cent of the wood being produced in this country and in Victoria is, comes from those sources. We want to see people employed in growing hemp as an alternative source of fibre. We can be growing and supporting our regional communities, not leaving them abandoned in a dying industry. And I want to thank, in particular, the activists and the campaigners who have fought so hard over so many years to be protecting our native forests, the protesters, the citizen science, the organisations and the people who are taking legal action. We have seen three separate court cases in, the last, in recent months that have found Vic Forests and its logging have broken the laws that are meant to be protecting our forests and the animals that live in them. The courage and the commitment of these campaigners has made a huge difference, a huge difference to our forests, a huge difference to our future, a huge difference to our climate, and I want to thank them. And the voters of Victoria should be listening to this as well, because the Labor Party, when it comes to forests, is a party of too little, too late, 
and Victorians would do very well to remember that on Saturday. I put the question. Uh, does any other member have a contribution? We have 30 seconds left. I put the question. Those of the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.